Something happens in my brain every September 1st. It has happened every year since I've uh, been here. Uh, September 1st rolls around and in my mind it's supposed to cool off. And of course, as you know, it doesn't in the month of September. And so September, I always have the same conversation with the Lord. I say, Lord, do you not need a servant in San Diego? <laughs> Doesn't ministry need to be done in Malibu? How about Santa Barbara? Don't you need one more in Santa Barbara? And then somewhere in the first week or two of October, it cools off and I say, never mind. So I love it here. It's finally cooled off. It's paradise until about June 1st, and aren't you glad you live in Phoenix, Arizona now? Amen. You don't have to shovel heat, so <laughs> thankful for that. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 and 6 uh, tonight. We are closing out the series on financial freedom, and I promise you, you're, I'm going to start this sermon, and you're going to think that I have, this has nothing to do with financial freedom. I promise I'll get there. Just give me a little time to lay out context. Uh, Galatians is probably the first book Paul ever wrote. It, he wrote it early in his ministry. Uh, Galatians is a, a very frustrating book. Paul was angry and upset and frustrated and mad when he wrote this book because of what was going on in his ministry. He was a relatively new Christian. The Lord had prepared him for ministry. He is now going about the Roman Empire, starting churches and talking to them about salvation by grace through faith and how you're in bondage to your sin and you can't earn your way to heaven. There's nothing you can do in and of yourself redemptively, no acts that you can do to, to earn your way back into the presence of God. And the only chance you have at salvation is through the grace of God, through the death of Jesus Christ, and through the blood of Jesus Christ, you can now be set free from your sins, you can live in freedom, and in that freedom, you are restored to relationship with God, you live the abundant life here, and you go to heaven when you die. Isn't that a great message? Great message. And so people would respond and churches would grow and he would, he would grow these churches up and they would be good size and then he would leave and go to the next city. And as soon as he left, there would be a group of Christians that would come usually from Jerusalem, but somewhere in Israel, and they still believed that Jesus was not enough, that you needed Jesus plus a few laws and a few of uh, uh, different things out of the Jewish religion that you needed to add to Jesus. And so their whole idea of salvation was salvation is Jesus plus a few other things we're going to give you. So if you're going to be saved, you need the blood of Jesus, but you also need to be circumcised. You need the blood of Jesus, but you also need to obey all of these Jewish laws that we're going to hand to you. You need Jesus Christ, but you also need to observe these special days on the Jewish calendar. And if you do that, then you're a really good Christian. And it just infuriated Paul. And so Paul writes this letter uh, to Galatians, and, and he's writing it to these churches who have now been taught these things by these Jewish Christians, and he's saying, listen, I gave you the whole gospel, and I'm telling you right now, if anyone preaches to you anything other than what I have preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. In other words, the great pastor Paul said, may they go to hell. <laughs> Pretty strong language, the strongest language in all the New Testament. And so Galatians is this book where he then lays out the theology behind why Jesus is enough. And if you go back into law, if you have any sort of system of legalism where you're saying you need to do something in order to gain God's love and, and forgiveness of sins other than receive Jesus Christ, if you have some acts you have to do, that's bondage, that's legalism, and that is not a part of the gospel. And these people were back in bondage. And so now in, in chapters 5 and 6 of Galatians, he is ending, he is concluding this theology and this message, and he's now going to go to practical application. And so here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 to begin uh, the conclusion of this. He says, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And so what he's telling these people is, you need to know that these Jewish Christians have come in and they've taught you false doctrine. 
and they're wanting you to go back into slavery. And I'm telling you, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He set you free. He's put the Holy Spirit in your heart. You need to walk by the Spirit. You don't need to walk by the flesh. And you certainly don't need to go back to law because law is simply legalism. It is simply bondage. And you have been set free. Amen? So then he goes through chapter 5, and he begins to talk about what that means. But Paul understands something about human nature. He understands that there is this counterintuitive truth that real freedom does come with boundaries. That some people will take the freedom of Christ and say, you know what, the Holy Spirit is living in my heart and I've been forgiven of my sins and now all I have to do to seek forgiveness is to pray and ask God to forgive me. So that's pretty well a license for me just to live any way I want to live. And so there's certain personality types who they let that sinful nature take over because after all, we're just going to be forgiven for all of our sins anyway. So they just take off and live any way they want. And so in verse 13, here's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, will call to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbors yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And so he's coming in and he's trying to lay out the boundaries. He's trying to lay out uh, some, some guideposts to keep us kind of in the middle of the road of grace. You don't go back into legalism because that's bondage, but you also don't indulge the flesh because that is bondage. Because real freedom comes through Jesus Christ, but staying within the parameters that he has laid out for us. In other words, the law that he has given us, the rules that he has given us, is not because he wants to bind us with law. He wants to set us free. It's just our freedom comes when we learn to live within the boundaries of the way God has set up life for the abundant life. Let me give you an illustration. We have the freedom in this country to drive our motor vehicles on streets and on highways around this nation. And it's a great freedom to have. But let me tell you what makes that freedom free. It's all the laws and the rules associated with the freedom of driving. It is the speed limit signs. It is the, all the traffic on this lane is gonna go one direction and all the traffic in this lane is going to go another direction. It's the traffic signals that tell us when to stop and when to go. And if we took all of that away and there was, there was no boundaries around freedom, it would no longer be freedom. You know what it would be? Chaos. It would be chaos. Now, I have actually experienced this. My daughter and son-in-law are missionaries in Kathmandu, Nepal. Nepal is a poor nation who is just coming into about the mid-20th century. And all of these people, there's about three and a half or four million people that live in this city, and most of them now are making enough money that they can own a scooter or a small car. And so they now have the freedom of transportation, but they did not have a government that made laws. So there's no speed limits in the whole city. There's one traffic signal in the whole city. There's no dotted lines on the roads in the whole city. And there's three and a half million people trying to get from point A to point B with no boundaries. And I'm telling you, it is not freedom. It is chaos. And I told the Lord, if he just got me out alive, I'd come back here and I'd never go back. <laughs> now, I haven't told my kids yet that yet, so don't let them know. But I'm telling you, it was chaos because real freedom comes with parameters. And the parameters are laid down by God for our good so we can live the freedom of the abundant life. And so Paul has now laid out these guideposts. One on one side, legalism is bondage. And one on the other side, living in your sinful nature is bondage. And where is freedom? Right in the middle where it's saved by grace through faith living with the power of the Holy Spirit, but within the boundaries of the laws that God has set up to protect us so we can be free. That is freedom. So then he ends the book with a promise. 
We call it the law of sowing and reaping, but I like to see it as a promise from God. And here's what he says now in chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction, and whoever sows to please the, from the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So Paul now is going to lay out for us an illustration, and it's a farming illustration. And it's an illustration about a farmer that sows seed into the ground. Now, in this part of the world, they would begin sowing seed into the ground somewhere in March to April time frame. And so the farmer would go out, he would till the soil, he would work hard, he would put the seed into the ground, and then he would not expect to harvest till sometime late September to mid-October. So he's got a good seven months, depending on the area, maybe even eight months, where he's waiting for this seed to grow up to harvest and he is going to reap what he sowed. And it's hard work being a farmer. You have to prepare the dirt. You have to fertilize the land. You have to get it ready to receive the seed. You put the seed in the ground. You work the ground. You keep all of the weeds out. You make sure that the birds don't come in and steal the seed. You have to protect the ground and protect the seed, and you work hard and you pray hard because they didn't have irrigation systems. They had to depend on God for the rain, and you waited, and you waited, and you waited, and you worked, and you waited, and you worked, and you waited. And then sometime about this time of year, they would begin to harvest all that they had sown and worked so hard for from March until October. And that was a long process. And Paul now comes and uses that illustration and says, that's an illustration of life. That's an illustration about living within the guidelines to where you can walk in freedom instead of in bondage on one side or the other. And it's a promise from Scripture that always comes true. And he said, for those who want to sow in the flesh, they're going to reap death. They're going to reap destruction. Their lives are going to be full of pain and heartache and hurt, and it's going to be miserable. It's going to happen. And God will not be mocked. Now, let me tell you what he means by that. You're going to reap what you sow, but it never happens overnight, right? Right? And so, you may be living a life, and you may be getting away with something, and you're saying, you know what, I've gotten away with this now for a month. I've gotten away with this now for two months. I've gotten away with this for three months. And you begin to think, you know what, I've kind of pulled one over on God. He's not catching on. I'm going to get away with this. And Paul says, trust me, the harvest is coming. And if you're reaping in the flesh, I mean, if you're sowing in the flesh, you're going to reap in the flesh, and it's going to be painful, and it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt a whole lot of people around you. It's going to be death to you, and it may not happen today, and it may not happen tomorrow, and it may not happen this year. It may not happen next year, but it is a law of God and a promise from Scripture. You will reap what you sow, and God will not be mocked. It is going to happen. You haven't pulled one over on God. But the opposite is also true. He says there's these people out there and they're, they're sowing in their spiritual life and they're sowing in relationships. And they're sowing in all of these different areas. And they're sowing in the spirit. And they're going to reap eternal life. They're going to reap abundant life. They're going to reap joy. They're going to reap happiness. They're going to reap contentment. They're going to reap supernatural peace in their life. All the things that the world wants and can't find, you're going to reap if you're sowing in the Spirit. But guess what? It may not happen today. You're not going to sow on the 15th of October and reap on the 19th of October. 
You may have to sow righteousness for a while before the results of reaping show up. It may be six weeks, it may be six months, or it may be six years, but it's a promise. It's a truth out of Scripture that will always come true. And so he says on the other side, so don't be weary in doing good. Because Satan is going to try to convince you that it's not worth all that sowing in the spirit because you're never going to reap anything good out of it. You're just wasting your time. And all those worldly people are out there and they're having a good time and they're successful and it all looks great. And you're sitting in a church and you're being all spiritual and you're trying to reap in the spirit. And what do you have to show for it? Boy, and sometimes we just want to give up. And Paul says, listen to me. Listen to me. You don't want to give up. You don't want to give up. Because the day will come when all of that sowing is going to reap eternal life and abundant life and joy and contentment and peace. So don't get weary. Don't give up. Don't listen to the voice of the evil one that tells you it's not worth it because it's always worth it because the harvest is coming soon. The harvest is coming soon. Now, you're probably asking the question, I thought this was about financial freedom. What in the world does this have to do with financial freedom? Well, here's what's interesting about this truth, is that several years later, about 10 years later, Paul is writing a letter to the church in Corinth. And he's talking to them about money and financial blessing. And he goes back and he quotes this law out of Galatians chapter 6 to that church. And here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And so Paul takes this great spiritual principle and he applies it directly to your finances and says, let me tell you the truth about your money. You are going to reap what you sow. So here's what we've done with you for the last five weeks. We have talked to you about giving and tithing. We've talked to you about living off a budget, the parameters that will set you up to live in economic freedom. We've talked to you about getting out of debt. We've kind of laid the groundwork for you on how to live in freedom financially. And now God is saying, let me give you a truth about your finances. You have all this information at your disposal, but here's what's going to happen. Some of you are cutting corners. You're not tithing. You're not living off a budget. You have a lot of debt, but you're not taking it serious, but you're not in crisis mode yet. And so you're thinking, you know what? Those are nice sermons, but it doesn't apply to me because I'm not in crisis mode. I seem to be doing okay. Here's what the Bible's telling you. You're just like the federal government. It doesn't matter how much debt you're in. The day's coming. You're going to have to pay it. You're sowing seeds. You're sowing seeds of debt. You're sowing seeds of, of unproductive spending. You're sowing seeds of selfishness. You're sowing seeds refusing to tithe and give God his first 10%. And you know what? It may not come today, and it may not come this month, and it may not come next month, but I'm telling you, you're on a trajectory in which you will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. That day will come. And when that day comes, you're going to be exceedingly sad that you didn't take these truths and apply them to your life while it was easier to apply them to your life. And the converse is true. Some of you have taken these to heart and you say, you know what? I'm going to start tithing, although I don't have the money to do it, but I'm going to walk in obedience and faith. And you know what? I'm going to start living off a budget, although I don't know how to spell budget, but I'm going to, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And you know what? I heard about debt and I'm going to get out of debt and it's going to be hard, but I'm going to do this. And so you know what's happened is you've started applying these principles to your life. But guess what? It's month one 
And it doesn't look any better. In fact, it might look even a little bit worse. And you know what? Next month, it may not look that much better either. And you're going to be tempted to say, you know what? I heard all those lessons about financial freedom, and I've put them into practice, but I don't see the results yet. I'm not reaping anything positive about this. Maybe I should just give up and do it the way I was doing it before. And God says, let me tell you something. Don't do that. Don't do it. Because I'm telling you, you're sowing the seeds of financial blessing that it may not happen in this calendar year, and it may not happen next year, but I'm telling you the day is coming when you're going to receive a financial harvest that's so big it's unimaginable. But you got to sow the seeds because you reap what you sow. Here's what I want us to do tonight. You're going to go into your groups here in just a few minutes. And you're going to talk about some of these issues. But what I want you to think through is the big areas of your life. And I want you to ask the question, what am I sowing? Because whatever I'm sowing now, at some point in the future, I'm going to reap. So I want you to look, if you're a parent, on how you're parenting your children. You know, Brad Baker gave a couple of great lessons on how to parent not too long ago. And some of you are saying, you know what, my kids aren't that bad. And that stuff Brad Baker talked about is pretty hard to do. And I don't like hard because that's not fun. So I think I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because it's okay. I want you to change your attitude and think, what am I sowing into my children? Because it may be okay today, but it may not be okay when they're 16. And the reverse is true. You may have taken those principles and you may be putting them into practice and your kids are a disaster right now because you've actually put parameters around them and they are in culture shock. And you're saying, man, this is hard. But what are you doing? You're sowing seeds of righteousness later on. And they may be having a hard time right now, but you know what? I'm not concerned about your five-year-old. I want to see what they're like when they're 25, right? Because that's when we reap what we sow. And I want you to think about your marriage or your dating relationship. And I want you to ask your question. What am I sowing into my marriage? Because some of you may be going, you know what? My marriage is fine. I don't need to sow anything into it. Well, it's fine now. But are you sowing into it that's going to make it good later? Or are you going to wake up in five years and go, you know what, I don't even know who she is or he is anymore. Or you may be sowing because your marriage is in trouble and you've gotten some principles for some great teaching that this church has done on marriage and you're applying those principles and it doesn't seem to be working and your spouse doesn't seem to be changing. And God just says, just keep sowing. Just keep sowing. Just keep sowing righteousness into that marriage. Just keep sowing righteousness into that relationship. And the day will come where it's going to reap a great marriage for you. So I just want you to ask this question tonight in your groups. What am I sowing into my most significant relationships in life? Boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, children, friendships. What am I sowing into my financial life? Am I doing it God's way or am I cutting corners? What am I sowing into my career? What am I sowing into my spiritual relationship with God? Because ultimately, if I'm sowing in the flesh, it's going to reap me some very painful consequences. But if I am sowing in the spirit, I am going to find the abundant life. You know what everyone in the world is looking for? Happiness, right? Don't you hear it all the time? Just want to be happy. You want me to tell you how to find happiness? The next right choice. Happiness is the result of the next right choice. So, 
So righteousness, so faithfulness. Just make the next right choice. Just get in a habit of stringing good choices together. And what you'll find is you'll wake up one morning and happiness has hit you right upside the head. Well, I want to thank you for joining us online today. You know, a question that a lot of people ask us is, how do you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ? And we like to call it the ABCs of committing our life to the Lord. Uh, a just simply stands for acknowledge. Acknowledge in your heart that you uh, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The B stands for believe. Believe that Christ died for your sins personally. And then C, confess your sins to the Lord. I want to encourage you today to do that, to acknowledge Jesus Christ being the Son of God, to believe in your heart that He is the Lord, that He died for your sins. And then right now, can I lead you in a prayer where you can confess your sins to the Lord and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ? Would you just say these words with me? Just say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today because of Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross. Thank you for your great love for me. I want to follow you with all my heart. I want to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so today I confess my sins. I've made mistakes. I have sinned. And I give my heart to you. Thank you for hearing my prayer and for forgiving my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says the moment you pray that prayer and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He hears that prayer and He forgives you and you begin a brand new life with Jesus Christ. I'd encourage you, if you don't have a church, man, find a church, get involved, and uh, start using your gifts in that church. Be a part of that church community. If you're in the Phoenix area here, we'd love to have you worship the Lord with us here and join our, our family here. So there's a little card there on your uh, menu button that says Get Connected. Just click that. Fill that out, and uh, we'll respond to you ASAP. Or if you have prayer requests, please uh, hit the prayer request button, and that goes immediately to our prayer ministry, uh, and they will pray for you, pray for your needs. But uh, the most important thing is to get involved in a church that really loves Jesus Christ and uh, teaches the Word of God. God bless you, and uh, we rejoice with you in your new life with Jesus Christ.